Well, good evening, everyone. This is AJ Monte, Chief Market Strategist with the Market Guys, and I'd like to welcome you to our open house Q&A session, which is our monthly live event that we do online. <clears throat> if you're just joining the Market Guys for the first time, uh, what we do is we have this broadcast uh, every month on the Monday that follows every expiration Friday. Now, for some people, that sounds a little confusing, so let me explain that. The third Friday of every month is the last day that options are traded. So the Monday that follows the third Friday of every month is not always the third Monday or the fourth Monday. It, it depends on what the month is. It's, it's kind of like uh, you know, February is a shorter month, and March 1st is a Saturday. Uh, Friday is the last day for the month, and then Monday is the first month of, of the next month. So in order not to confuse things, we let everyone just keep track of the option calendar and remember that our broadcast follows Options Expiration Friday. Uh, if you want to become a regular attendee, then make sure you just go to the Market Guys website, and when you see us change the invitation link, you could just register for that. And, and then it'll send you a reminder if you again not sure where that is this is the market guys website and if you scroll down you can see here there's a register now button so when we're done with uh, with this session uh, today which is the 24th then I'm going to post the March link so you know, by tomorrow you should be able to have that and you can register it. It won't be a problem for you. So uh, I'm, I'm really happy with what's going on uh, in the progress uh, of our uh, reports, especially for the equity traders. This year so far, we have a 100% accuracy rate with regard to the stocks that we've picked. One of the reasons for that is I'm using contingent buy orders uh, because I'm a little cautious in this market. I don't want people buying at a top. We're waiting for the signal to occur first, and then once we have the signal, we're getting in. So at the beginning of the year, we had a couple of buys uh, that were posted, but we never got the signal that we were looking for. We, we didn't get the green candle the following day, so we stayed out of those trades. Mm -hmm. And that actually happened for a couple of weeks in a row before we started getting some traction with some really good trades. Uh, one of which is um, is the gold. We we got into IAU. <clears throat> now I'll show you this. I'll show you this on the daily chart. We got into IAU as it was bouncing, and um, I'll talk a little bit more about this. But right now it looks like we ha today we filled the gap target that I had set set way back just on the 13, and the volume is dropping. So for those of you who are in gold, you might want to move to the sidelines until we get a little bit of a pullback and then you could pick another entry point when it bounces off of support. So the markets are, are trading very technically and what I, what I thought I'd do is start off with the diamonds. This is the Dow Jones Industrial Average ETF and I started marking the monthly chart because this is a tremendous trend that we see here. At the uh, in the first quarter of 2009, after the crash of 2008, we had a bull market that just hasn't quit. But don't get caught in this bull trap. This is a a very very dangerous place to to start to accumulate long positions, and I'll show you why. At the end of most quarters, uh, first quarters that is, we generally see tax selling, and when you have a market that's that's so overextended to where it is right now the tax selling could be that much uh, more dramatic these hash marks that I have here starting from uh, back in in April of 1998 uh, here look at my cursor look up look at the date up here see where it says D watch that when I highlight this cursor right there see that that's April 1st right there 1998 you could see that right after April, um, the, the selling really came in hard. Here's another one. It doesn't look like much. It really doesn't look like much on the monthly chart, but you have to go back and look to see. From here, there's, there's May. Here's April right here. 
starting in May, the selling came in, and you know the diamonds opened at, at uh, right around 108, and four months later it was it was down uh, around the lows of 99. So the market actually came off 800 points in, from that sell point there. Again, look at this one. This is April. This is April 1st of uh, 2001, and the markets really went from they went from a high of 109, and then bottomed out right around around 79 and a half. This was a dramatic sell-off. Again, each one of these marks April 1st, the beginning of the April month, and you can see what happens is that the majority of the time, even if it's short-lived, we we get these sell-offs that take place. And what I expect to happen uh, this coming April and May is a, a more severe sell-off. I, I truly believe that this market could make a 50% correction, and you could see the markets easily drop 5,000 points from the highs. Remember, the, di the diamonds are 1 one-hundredth of the Dow. So if you're seeing 161 right here, that's 16,100. This halfway point, that's not even the halfway point, right around 110 is Dow 11,000. Uh, so that's, that's over 5,000 point drop in what would be a reasonable correction. Uh, some of you uh, may not know technical analysis as well as others, but I want to show you a tool here that most trading platforms have, and I don't talk too much about, about the Fibonacci numbers uh, unless I'm, I'm looking for areas of pullback. The Fibonacci numbers is a mathematical sequence that's used in many different um, applications, but in the stock market, the way you do this is if you have E-Trade or Schwab or TD or you're up there in Scotia, they have this built into that platform. It's, and what you do is you basically draw a line from the very low of the beginning of a trend to a most recent high within that trend. So if I take this low and I connect it to this high here, you'll see my Fibonacci numbers are right in place. Remember what, where I, I forecasted the pullback to, right around 110. Well, if you look at that, the 50% retracement number for the Fibonacci numbers is right around 115. So this, this uh, again, confirms my suspicion that we could see a pullback. And yeah, everyone wants to, you know, not let go of a of a bull market, especially if you're making money. But the most dangerous thing is that people hold on because everything seems so positive. Yes, this could still go on for another month. Don't get me wrong. But if you're going to buy, you really better make sure your stops are in place, and you better make sure you're buying on contingent buy orders where you're getting a positive signal. Because if you're not doing anything to back up the signal then uh, you know, that, that could be very painful. Uh, another thing about this, uh, this level, even, even going down to uh, the 103 area, this is a major support level here back uh, at, at the end of the, of the downward turn in 2011. Uh, here is another support level. So we have support levels that are relatively close to the Fibonacci retracement uh, pullback points. Um, if, you, if you go back and look at the at the general markets, you'll notice that in a lot of cases the Fibonacci's have have uh, worked out pretty well. Let's look at this. I'll show you um, that from this low to to this high. Let's move it from this low. I'll draw another one to this high, and you can see that this whole area of support was right on a Fibonacci retracement level of 38.2, and it even went down below the 50% mark and, and continue to bounce off of these Fibonacci numbers. So uh, again, a, a very useful tool. I wouldn't use it to, uh, to forecast. I, I would rather you use it to defend, to, to put some kind of a, a strategy in place that will help you protect your positions. Okay, let me get rid of those lines, clean up my charts a little bit. And what I like to do is switch to uh, do a trend line again. Now I'd like to look at the Russell 2000. I had some lines drawn up here. Uh, again, look look at this vertical move. Now, now this is a 
year chart of the Russell 2000, a 20 year chart. And if you look at this low, there was a 50% correction from this low to this high, but we have not had a correction yet on this upward trend. Not yet. This is, this is the most extended the Russell 2000 has been in 20 years. And I'm not using any moving averages here. If, if you did, you'll, you'll be able to gauge the distance and how far the prices are moving away from the moving averages, but you can imagine the, the prices are moving dramatically above the moving averages and there there hasn't been a correction yet. So again, the Russell 2000 is a more broad-based index than the diamond, uh, the diamonds, which only represent the Dow 30. Uh, but again, we, we really, this market needs a pullback. We need a pullback to here to, to have this uh, stay healthy and continue to get new New growth into the market. Um, if we don't get if we don't get any kind of a bounce off of these support levels here, then guess what? <laughs> it could go a lot lower than you and I may even expect, even down to these support levels. So that that could be pretty scary for the Russell 2000 if it starts testing these levels, because that would be more than a 60 or 70 percent pullback in the Russell 2000. Let's look um, look at the spiders. SP 500, same thing. Dramatic upward move. No and no evidence whatsoever of a pullback since October of 2011. So we're still in this extreme upward move. That is at an angle that's that's even steeper than some of the best uh, trends that we've had. Even looking back here, you can see this trend here. Uh, the this angle look at the angle if you took a protractor and measured this angle this angle is the steepest it's been in 20 years with no sign of a pullback uh, as of yet uh, finally uh, if you look at the volume the highs on the volumes are deteriorating which if you've been following the market guys you know that the volume is the only leading indicator that you actually have that tells us the the strength of the trend the buyers if, if they were extremely motivated still even at the highs the volumes would be going up they wouldn't be going down like they are now they'd be going up so we're seeing a price volume divergence that again has me raising the caution flag so you know sometimes you, you hold on to the the caution flag and you're waving and i've been waving it for a while now and people start they start to get numb uh, to to hearing, oh, yeah, we're going to go down, we're going to go down. But I'll tell you something, I'm not trying to scare anyone out of the market. I'm just trying to get people to protect themselves uh, from a, a falling market that could be pretty dramatic when it finally takes place. Now, finally, let's look at the Qs, and then we can start analyzing your stocks. QQQ. This is the NASDAQ power shares. Again, I'm just drawing a trend line to signal the lows here. I'm connecting this low to that low and all these lows in between. And you can see this is a trend line. But we're also in a, a, a fairly well-defined uh, channel with us being more or less at the upper part of this channel here. Um, what's really interesting is that we are approaching 20-year highs for the NASDAQ. Look at this. Right around 110. I don't know if we'll get there before the sell-off, uh, the tax sell-off, but look at it. We're approaching the 20-year highs, but look at what's happening for the past five years. We have a five-year deterioration in volume. Five years. I I can't remember the last time I saw a, a such a long stretch of uh, decreasing volume. Now, usually, if you look, see, this was a very long stretch of increasing volume, but I've never seen that much decrease. And usually what happens is you see, yeah, I'll zoom in here so you can see. Usually what you see are an up move in volume, then it'll come down, you see, then it starts to build back up again, and then it starts to drop a little bit. It happens, it's kind of like you're watching waves on an ocean. They usually go up and down. Uh, but I've never seen this much of a prolonged, down with trend with the most recent yearly bond. Look, what I'm talking about is from from in the past year. Now get rid of get rid of these lines here. Look at look at the average volume 
for just the past year and a half. Look at that. I'm just going to connect the tops. And that's not even average. It's probably a little bit low. I'm just connecting the tops there. Look how low this volume is compared to some of the tops that we saw from 2011, uh, 2010, over to 2012. So we're consistently averaging volumes, average volumes that are less than half of what they once were in this upward trend. Remember, these were holding fairly steady right back in 2010 to 2012 while the prices were going up. But now they're holding steady but at a much lower uh, average volume and, and, the, and the trend is increasing. That's very, very interesting that that's happening. So, uh, you know, keep an eye on this and hopefully you'll be able to make some money on the way down, especially the option traders. Our goal is to try to put the option traders into some positions that will make them money while the market drops, hence the reason why I was trying to get people into the gold and silver markets, because as the markets drop, gold and silver are going to look very, very attractive. So um, what, I, what I did is, uh, if you have questions, we could take questions. I'm not taking stocks yet. Uh, Bill says, uh, but increasing volume can be attributed to the retail investors out of the market. Absolutely, Bill. The retail investors are very confused. They don't know what to do. And, and uh, you know, when you, when you throw in the, um, you know, the uh, eco-political, uh, you know, um, landscape on top of this, you know, there's, there's still talk of inflation. Uh, there's still talk of uh, currency fluctuations. If you look at what happened last month in, uh, in Turkey, uh, there was a move to increase interest rates to offset the downturn in the currency. Once you get a basket full of currency starting to go through that devalu uh, devaluation, also known as inflation, uh, what happens is it starts a chain reaction that could actually wrap its way around the world. So you, you definitely want to keep an eye on volume because it, the first thing that happens, Bill, is the smaller investor will get nervous and move to the sidelines. But here's also what happens. If they get nervous enough, they start redirecting their funds in their IRA and retirement accounts to cash. And you have to understand whether it's the smaller investor driving this or not, when people close out of their mutual funds that are in their retirement accounts, the fund managers are seeing selling within their funds and now they are the only ones left to hold up the price. So it becomes heavier and heavier for them to hold the price higher because now when, when a mutual fund is sold within a retirement account, someone has to buy it. And a lot of times it's the institution that's actually managing the fund. As a former trader, uh, you know, we used to have to take the opposite side of a lot of the trades that came into our book. So if the average uh, customer was selling on an opening, the, the traders were getting were getting very very long on the opening and eventually they had to get out. Now I was, I was speaking with one one of our uh, subscribers today and talking about uh, about Netflix. Let me show you this one. I, I'm sure this one will come up. But what? Look at this one. Netflix, huh, crazy crazy stock that this is. Netflix has gone vertical. Okay, in this this move here, where you know it was trading below fifty dollars you know two years ago uh, or a year and a half ago it's trained fifty dollars it's up almost a thousand percent a thousand percent on decreasing volume how could that happen well here's how it happens it's being manipulated that's exactly what's happening I'll show you um, uh, I'll show you an actual uh, screen from uh, I'm gonna go to yahoo.com uh, I want to open up uh, here. I'll just, I'll just Google uh, what I usually do is NFLX uh, PE uh, ratio. Okay, uh, I'll show you what, what comes up. I, I like uh, the Yahoo Finance site. It's pretty, pretty good. And right here, I think that, that's Nasdaq.com. Where is it? Here it is, Yahoo Finance. Um, if I put Netflix in there, look at the PE. You know that that. Uh, <laughs> That is actually getting a little bit better because they they actually had earnings, but but look down at the look at the institutional report. Where is that? Oh, I have to move my screen around because I have it blocked. Um, 
if you go and look at the key holders, um, the major holders of the stock, check this out. Now, keep in mind that this report was updated in December. See, right here, the, these institutional holders reported at the end of last year of what their holdings were in the stock. But this is what's happening. The percentage of the float that's owned by institutions is 90%. So the general public is only holding on to actually less than 10%. Because these are the number of shares held by insiders and 5% owned. Oh, there's 2%. So about 8% is what's being held by the general public. So what happens is you got Capital Research. This is a big major uh, fund. T. Rowe Price. Uh, State Street Corporation. MetLife uh, pushes a lot of straight, State Street funds. You got BlackRock. Look at the number of shares they're holding. So... Let's say T. Rowe Price uh, wants to get out of the shares. How, how are they going to do that? They, what are they going to do, sell to some of these other guys that are already holding three to five million shares of, of uh, Netflix? No, they can't. Th these other institutions are not going to buy from them if they, if they have to get out. So how do they get out? What they do, and this is, this is the manipulation I see all the time, is they upgrade the stock and put really high price targets on. So if, if, if the stock is trading 447, they're going to say, okay, um, you know, BlackRock upgrades Netflix, puts price target at 550. What do you think is going to happen as soon as that news hits the street? The general public is going to rush in, and they're going to buy the stock on that recommendation. And at the same time, T. Rowe Price is going to sell to the general public and you think oh that's unethical I truly believe that's unethical but it's it's totally legal nowadays that line is being very confused what's legal what's ethical sometimes some people don't care the difference anymore but what I'm trying to do is I'm, I'm lobbying local congressmen to try to uh, to uh, implement a rule that if an institution upgrades a stock they could not sell any shares until 60 days after the report has come out. I think that would be very fair. See, in the IPO market, the initial public offering market, if you buy shares in a stock, you can't sell those shares for 30 days because it's not a pump and dump kind of a environment. They have to add some stability. So what's happening is this is really a pump and dump strategy. The institutions upgrade it, they dump it to the general public, and then they walk away with this huge profit because they've been buying into it all the whole time to the higher levels. So again, I'm, I'm campaigning for the for the average person in hopes that we get some kind of regulation that way. Uh, only time's going to tell, but I'm not going to make a lot of friends in the mutual fund market, that's for sure, or, or in the money managers. Uh, they will not like me for that, but something really has to be done because I don't think it's fair. Again, look at Netflix going straight up and the volume is dropping quite dramatically and it's starting to approach. Remember, this is a monthly chart. We only have one more week. This is the lowest volume we've had right here since since uh, 2009 when we had volumes at that level. You see that? So uh, we're reaching a point where I think uh, the camel, uh, the, the straw is going to break the camel's back here and we're going to see a pullback. This too can see a dramatic pullback all the way to 200. Uh, you can see easily I can could, I could see this pulling back to maybe even 300 points before it starts finding support. Okay, I've talked enough about these stocks. Let's look at your stocks. Uh, if you like to type in a symbol, I'm going to go first come, first serve uh, on that. And I see a couple of people uh, uh, talking about puts on the spiders. I, I think, uh, Simon, if you're going to buy a put, wait for, uh, wait for the, uh, the downturn in at least the weekly chart before you start buying. And don't buy front month options. Do not buy front month options. If you're looking at a weekly report on the spiders, this is a pretty good candle uh, because it's at resistance up here. Uh, but you know, by the end of this week, that might be a breakout over the highs. If it starts going lower and you start to see negative candle, believe it or not, this could still wind up being an, a negative candle by the end of the week. Then I would expect a pullback 
uh, to and the spider is at least to a role reversal point right around there. So uh, the the options that you would buy are not going to be short term options. Try to refrain from buying options that are going to expire in a couple of weeks. Yes, they're cheap. They look really cheap, but they generally perform very poorly because you're buying time value. It's better to buy a more expensive option that has less time value but more intrinsic value. And yes, they are more expensive, but you're getting your money's worth by going with the longer term option because there's a lot more you can do with it. Okay, I'm looking for, let's see, uh, Diana wants to look at BI. AIB Diane is in on this at uh, at 38. Uh, Diana, is this right? You're in Biogen at 38 dollars. Is that a typo or, or uh, you're in that at 38 dollars? Holy mackerel! Uh, well, um, the signs on the weekly chart are looking very bearish, uh, Diana. So uh, you have to look at this. This is and it's very sim it's very similar to inverted hammer. And again, look at the volume decrease. So you have the stock going up pretty dramatically on the on dropping volume. Uh, there's a good chance the stock could start dropping. So Diana, what I would do, if you own it at 38, I would I would sell calls in it. Uh, I don't know if you're an option trader, but if if I would sell calls, let me see. Uh, I'm just saying, Diana, put another note in there, making sure that that's the right price. Yeah, that's right. Bought at 38. Congratulations. I would actually sell calls against this because if you sell, let's say you sell a 350 call, it's not even trading 350, but you could sell a 350 call on BIIB and collect a lot of money. Actually, if you look at the price, let's say you sell a March. A March 350 call, uh, you're collecting almost nine dollars on it. Can you see that? It's 850 bid, offered at nine. So you could you can sell that against your long position. Collect for every hundred shares, you can collect uh, 850 dollars for selling for agreeing to sell your stock higher, and it's not even there yet. And what could happen is you're lowering your cost basis even further from 38. Uh, you know you're you're lowering closer to 30, and and every time you sell these calls, it's now uh, lowering the cost basis. Even though that's an incredibly low cost basis for the stock, you could actually wind up with free stock if you keep selling calls against it, and and you can continue to do that until they actually sell, until you actually sell the stock. And then there's ways that you can collect a premium to get back in. Won't get won't get too far into the detailed option strategies, but uh, hopefully uh, you know that that idea will help you. Okay, Dennis is long Disney D I S. Dennis, do you have a price at all that uh, or a date that you bought it? No wait for that. Let's see D I S. I'll put that in here D I S and. Let's tell you, I'm looking. No, I'm looking at weekly charts because the weekly charts are giving us more information now because the volumes are really confirming the moves. Again, uh, look at Disney. Here it is. You see Disney long at. Hold on, I'm looking for the the price there. Dennis is long Disney. Sorry, Dennis. I'm looking for that right now. We got a scrolling thing going on. Okay, you bought it two weeks ago. So, um, you know, you, you bought it what, probably below 80. Now, here's the thing about Disney. The stock has been going up quite nicely since uh, 2011. Here's the trend. Now, again, if anyone's new to technical analysis, let me show you how to draw a trend line so that you know how to do this uh, effectively. You pick a low, preferably at the, at the beginning of the move. You pick a low. And then all you do is you try to connect as many of these lows as you can. There's some lows there. I'm continuing to draw. And then I extend. See what I'm doing? Then I extend. I try to connect some lows there. And I extend some more. There's my trend line. And you can see how nicely the stock bounces off of that trend line. Now, to draw a channel line, you would have to pick a high and run that high parallel to the trend line. 
while at the same time connecting as many highs as you can while you run it parallel. It's not a perfectly parallel line, but you can see the channel that we're dealing with. Now, Disney is at the upper end of this channel on the weekly chart with one, two, three, four, five consecutive green candles in a row. Keep that in mind as the volume is dropping. See that? Now, remember, this is a three year weekly chart. So, remember when, when we were in school, you had to take SAT exams and uh, IQ exams and all that? One of the big parts of those exams was recognizing patterns, especially numerical patterns. And sometimes, in some cases, it would be word patterns. Which word does not belong? Yeah, you remember those tests? Well, I'm going to challenge you here to go back to that point in time where you have to recognize patterns. If we have one, two, three, four, five green candles in a row, look at the past and see some of the longest stretches in green candles. Let's go all the way to the beginning here. One, two, three, four, five before you saw a red. One, two, three, four before you saw a red. Here's a long stretch. One, two, three, four, five, six before you saw a red. So from the looks of Disney, we're probably very close to a red candle showing up here soon. That's number one. Number two, when the stock reaches resistance on red candles, it starts to pull back quite dramatically. So I don't want to pop the bubble here for you, um, Dennis, but if, if you have a profit in this, you might want to take your profit and wait for the stock to drop back to the, the trend line again and then look to reposition yourself maybe around 71, 72. And that will save you... Uh, yeah, ten percent on the price of the stock going forward. So I think Disney is long overdue for a pullback. Now, if I go to a weekly, ch a daily chart, we might see a different signal. Oh well, there you go. Um, you have an inverted hammer, which is bearish, and you have a gap. Look at that. I didn't see that gap until I switched to the daily chart. Look where the gap is. Boom, right near seventy-two, right where I'm expecting that pullback to, to take place. So th this. Uh, most likely will this gap will most likely act as a magnet and pull the stock back down. Now remember, Disney does not like to leave gaps unfilled. Go back and look at all the gaps that happened before in Disney. Usually they're not this big. Usually they're smaller. So here's a downward gap and it filled. Here's a downward gap and it filled. Here's an upward gap and it filled. Look, 100% from what I can see, here's a gap that filled. Here's a small gap it filled. Uh, up, there's an up gap did not fill yet. That's, a, that's one of the, the 20 percenters that have not filled, but the majority of them have all filled. Here's a gap, here's a gap, here's upward gaps. Here's a big down gap that eventually filled. So what does that mean again? Well, it looks to me like Disney's going to come back to at least fill the gap, and then that might give you another point to buy. So be careful. Um, if you hold on, then understand that uh, you know that's going to be the cycle most likely for for the stock. Okay, we have um, Ron is asking me to consider LBMH a buy, and if so, what would be a good entry point? Okay, LBMH. LBMH. I'm going to put that in there. Uh, on a daily chart, it looks like a buy already, Ron. Uh, because you're bouncing off of uh, looks like a support area right here, right around three and a half. Uh, remember, this is a cheaper stock under five dollars, so it's going. It's not going to be supported by any institutions. Keep that in mind. Um, what I see right here is a major support at three and a half. So if you buy it at three ninety, or even buy it at four dollars, you would have to put your stop loss order somewhere below three and a half. I would probably put it right around 3.30 to 3.40. That's where I would put my stop. So allow yourself maybe a 60 cent risk per share and then if it closes below that support level and, and closes around 3.25 or 3.30 then get out. I've been uh, moving people more towards a manual stop with a, a price alert than an intraday stop and here's the reason why. Um, if you put a stop loss order 
in intraday with all the volatility that was seen there's a good chance your stop let's say you put it right you put it right here okay and and all of a sudden on one day the stock opens it goes down goes down to three dollars and then on that day it closes up at three and a half now you have this let's say you have a doji a, a, a half a hammer pattern up here now I'm trying to draw a hammer pattern without looking too ridiculous there okay so now you have a hammer pattern that's bullish you see during the day you could have easily gotten stopped out so what I'm trying to get people to do is use your your uh, price alert features that your brokers give you if you don't have that then go to Yahoo Yahoo Finance has a price alert feature I, I actually loaded that on my phone I have a smartphone and the alerts will come to me in the form of a text so if you have if you if you have a stop level that's at 325 and you already own it around 390 when you get the price alert that's telling you okay stock is trading at that level now you have to watch it towards the last 15 minutes of the trading day and then if it looks like it's going to close below that point then get out I mean if it's going to close below support and is at that point you get out if the stock goes down and then shoots back up and is now trading back over support I would actually buy more if that were to happen because hammer patterns are, are very reliable you can see here's a hammer pattern right there very reliable patterns so hopefully that helped you Ron all right um, okay Alan he's looking at DOG is it too soon to buy dog looks like it's ready to bottom out uh, well uh, for those of you that don't know what, what dog is it's actually uh, a contrarian uh, play that you could incorporate in the market it's it, it runs uh, opposite to the to the Dow so it's a short ETF what what you do is if you think the Dow is going to drop you would buy this now it looks to me uh, it looks to me Alan that this is a hammer pattern it would be great if it's green but this is still pretty good if, if tomorrow it's green I would then buy it and I would put my price target probably right here I wouldn't put it right exactly at the high I would put it right at the gap fill point right around right around 27 you know 2780 or 2790 that's where I would put it and then wait for it to do this and then when it starts to turn back down you you sell it that that's what I would look look for there. Uh, remember the the dog DOG is opposite of DIA. So that means if we're seeing uh, if we're seeing um, a, a hammer pattern on DOG, there's a good chance we're starting to see some bearish signals on DIA. Now I I don't know if this is accurate because this this platform is telling me that um, the diamonds closed up 0.85, which would be up 85 dollars for the Dow. But I have another, I have another watch list that's telling me the Dow was up 104. So I, I don't know which is the uh, the accurate one here at this point. Uh, it's hard, hard to say. So again, watch for the signals on DOG before you buy it. Make it a contingent order, and you'll be fine. Okay, PM and MO are at depressed prices here in a correction. Are they likely to go down even more, or are they uh, more likely to to be counter trend? Let's take a look at uh, PM first. I think that's Philip Morris, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Okay. All right. Now, um, PB. That's that's the initials you put on there. I I don't feel good about buying this at all right now, at least right now, and the reason is. It's in a downward trend, number one, and it looks like it bounced from this corrective move here, but it's pivoting down again. And it looks to me as as the stock is starting to move up, it's hard to see. Uh, I'll zoom in. As the stock is moving lower, you see here, the volume is starting to creep higher. So what what this little volume uptick is telling us is that the that the sellers are getting more motivated. So I probably uh, it doesn't matter how much you like the stock or like the company, I would not force a trade on this one because it's been in a depressed state and a downward trip for a long time. I and mean, look at the 
look at the uh, look at the monthly chart on this one. The monthly chart is showing a bearish engulfing pattern or close to one here and a definite bearish engulfing pattern right here. So what's happening is month after month, and you can look at the chart, you're getting bearish engulfing patterns. Now monthly charts are more significant than daily and even weekly charts. So when you see a bearish engulfing pattern here at the top, and you see another bearish engulfing pattern here, and another bearish engulfing pattern here, and it close to the bearish engulfing pattern there, I, I don't know why you would try to force that trade because, again, it looks to me like the trend is starting to reverse, and this could go a, a lot lower. And it's in a downward monthly uh, trend, trading channel as it is right now. So I, I don't like that one. Uh, MO, Altria, let's see, take a look at that. Um, Again, this is a monthly chart also showing, uh, well, this one doesn't look as bad because this one's still in an upward trend. It's not looking as bad. However, now that we see the upward trend on the, on the monthly chart, let's go to a weekly. We're kind of zooming out. Okay, that's, uh, yeah, I don't see a, I'm starting to see a little bit of a, a little bit of a pivot lower here. See, here's a case where the stock has been trying to go up, but the volume is dropping. I hope you understand the concept behind the volume versus price. The, the volume is, uh, think of it as this way, the volume is the gas pedal, okay? So the candles tell us what direction we're going, but the volume tells us how fast we're going in that direction and whether or not we're easing up on the gas pedal. So here the stock was going up, but the buyers are easing up on their gas pedal. So that, that's not a positive indication for me to get in there and feel really good about buying, you know, uh, MO right now. So I, I, there's so many other stocks that you can get into uh, that I, I think it would be a shame for you to try to force one because you heard a good report somewhere. Okay. Bruce is looking for UA. He's looking to. Bruce, are you looking to buy a put or uh, you already own a put? Let me help you out with that one. Let's see. Uh, Under Armour. I like the idea of buying a put if you haven't already uh, because here's why. Again, big upward move, vertical upward move. See that? Dramatic drop in price. Again, this is the weekly chart. See this? I'll zoom in here for you. This is a dramatic upward move. We have a bullish engulfing pattern here, so you got to watch that. But this is already starting to look like a spinning top. Now let's go to a daily chart. Daily. Ready? Here's. Let me get rid of that line so it doesn't confuse anybody. <clears throat> let me get rid of that. All right, here is stock gapped up. Good news on that. Um, it went a little bit higher today. On the next, by the way, this is something I'm recommending to get a long put position in. I like the January 2016 110 puts. I like those. Uh, if you haven't gotten into that, wait for a red candle and you know monitor the red candle, especially engulfing patterns or inverted hammers or even dojis. If all of a sudden you see a doji up here, dojis are very reliable. Uh, pivot point uh, signs. Doji looks like a little cross. It looks like that. If you see anything like that, then I would buy the put and then hold that put until the gap around 90 fills and then get out of the put when it starts going up or turn it into a put spread when this starts going up. So that one uh, looks overextended. Uh, Under Armour, I, look, as a lacrosse coach from my high school team, I love the equipment. I love the, heck, I, our whole team is fitted with Under Armour, um, Under Armour wear and, and lacrosse shorts and everything and jerseys. Uh, but I, I have to, I, you know, I have to step away. I can't fall in love with the product and then try to trade it uh, because if I do that, I, I, I wind up marrying the stock, and that's not a good thing. Okay. Um, let's see, where is that, uh, I'm looking for, if you could retype your symbols in there, please, we're getting a lot of wash through, so I don't want to answer the same ones, uh, okay, Sebastian, ATVI, Sebastian, what is your, um, 
what is your position on ATVI? I see you typed it in, but I'm, I'm not sure what it is. If you could let me know. ATVI. Boom. Put that in there. Activision. Um, look, I love gaps. I, I love them. I, I don't just like them. I love them because they're so reliable. Um, look at the chart. Again, I'll try to zoom in one, one so you can see the candles a little bit better. Look at this chart. And look at the look at the gaps on the chart, and tell me how many have filled out of the ones we're looking, and how many have come really close to filling. This is the obvious one right here. Here is a stock that gapped up, and if you don't know the formula for how gaps trade, let me let me go uh, to the market guy site for you here. Hold on. Uh, if you go to the market guys and click on videos. There is a, a, a video that we produced that was called Trading the Gap right here. See that? Go back and refer to that. In fact, look at that. The example I'm using is very close to what I just showed you. All right. When a stock gaps up, it usually takes three to five days on average. That's not all the time. It's on average. Three to five days before the gap starts to fill or come back. Here's one, two, three, four. On the fourth day, it started dropping to fill the gap. See that? Let's go back to our chart. Here is, here is a gap, a major gap up. One, two, three days before it started coming down and came very close to filling. Didn't do it, missed it by, missed it by 40 cents. But that's close enough. Here is one. Gap down. One, two days before it started going up. Uh, here's another gap down, and then it filled. Here's a gap down. Second day, it started to come back up, filled. The other thing that you have to know, and forgive me for those of you who have heard this before, but repetition is the best teacher. Once a gap fills, the stock generally reverses and goes the other way before finding support or resistance. So, look at what's happening here. This is a little bit over. Remember, on average, I was talking. One, two, three, four, five, six. This went seven days. All right, went two days over the average. And now it's starting to come down. And you notice what's happening here. As the stock continued to go up here, what was happening to the volume? See that? The volume is dropping. So, you don't have to say, okay, I'm going to short this stock. And I'm going to get out only when it gets to exactly that price. Look, I would be very happy to short the stock, and I would be, you know, static if I even got 50% recovery of that gap. I'd be very happy to short the stock and get out here before it bounces. I, I don't care. A, another good way to play this, Sebastian, is to buy a put. I don't even know if they have puts. I think they do. ATVI. I would buy a long-term put. I wouldn't buy a short-term put. I'd buy a long-term put. They do have them. Let's see. Let's see, January 16. Hey, that's pretty good. Look at this. The $20 puts are only offered at 3.5, and, and that's a pretty tight spread. There's only a 15 cents between the bid and the ask. That's really very, very good. That would probably be the best way to go because if you buy that put, the most you, go, you could lose is what you pay for the put. So your stop is built into that put. And that's a, that's a put, by the way, that you can keep for almost two years. So that's extreme. I'm almost, I'm almost thinking that even is a price error. I don't know. That looks really cheap to me. For a $20, op, for a $20 stock to have a two-year option at only around $3.5, that just seems very cheap to me. But here's what will happen. If that stock drops five dollars okay that put is going to go from three and a half to almost seven it will double see how do i know that because if a twenty dollar strike price is three and a half and a you know five dollars away five dollars more in the money is almost seven you're getting almost a double a hundred percent return on that if you were to, if you were to uh, short the stock and what's what's going on here yeah if you were to short this stock 
how would you how would you double your money? It'd be very hard. That stock would have to drop to eight dollars. You see, for you, for you to to even come close to making a, a decent return on investment. So this is this is a, a really good play from the put side. And uh, what I would do before you you buy any puts is I would check to see if there's any other earnings or news that's uh, getting ready to pop out, and then uh, go ahead and, and and look at that. Okay, let me try to find someone that has not gotten one in there yet. Okay, John Caruso, uh, Eaton. Let me see, what's ticker someone that? ETN? ETN, boom. Okay, his, uh, his position here is since October 2012, it's, it's performed well since, uh, since then and pays dividends. I would like to increase my position. Please analyze. Uh, okay. Now, be very, very, very careful of stocks that are just now increasing their dividend or pay high dividends because people will often get, a, get trapped in a dividend play, especially long-term investors. What happens is they'll buy a, um, a stock for $80, okay? Let's say you're buying this one. It's up around 80 and let's say it pays out a 3 or even 4% dividend, which is extremely high. And then before you know it, the stock goes from 80 to to 70. You're getting paid a 3% dividend, but the stock just dropped 12%. Now what? You're down. You're behind the curve now. You, you're, you're, you're not doing yourself any good. Um, you, the only stocks that I really like playing dividends on are the ones that are actually moving sideways in, in sideways trading channels or utility companies that are just slow and steady to move, those are the best ones to play dividends, number one. Number two, there's another strategy that you can incorporate even with Eaton Corp that will allow you to keep the stock and even enhance the dividend. I wasn't going to get into this, but since you asked the question, let me show you what I'm talking about. If I go to the option menu here and I see if there's dividends, I mean, see if there's options on this. Here is a um, here is a, a sixty-five dollar call. Now look at that. Look at this for a second. If I buy the stock at seventy-five, which is pretty close to where it's trading, and I sell a call at sixty-five in January two thousand fifteen strike price, what I'm what I'm doing in essence is I'm I am promising the buyer of this call that I'm going to sell them the stock at 65. And you might say, well, well, AJ, why in the world would you want to sell a stock $10 lower? Well, I'll be very happy to take a $10 loss if they're willing to pay me $12 to take a $10 loss. See this? You could probably sell that for $12. So what happens is, you you'll sell the stock ten dollars lower, but you're getting paid it. You're getting paid twelve dollars, so you're walking away with a dividend. Remember, this won't happen until January of next year. So your uh, your dividend is still being collected, but if the stock stays over sixty five, you're going to make an extra two dollars on your seventy five dollar investment. Okay, so you're getting an extra two and a half percent on top of your your already good dividend and here's what happens if you wind up selling the stock lower don't worry you're gonna get cash in your account and then what you do is you go right back into the market buy the shares back again and sell another call on it again and you do the same thing all over again immediately as soon as you sell the stock you buy it again and you, and they keep paying you these premiums uh, so this this is called the dividend plus play or I sometimes call it the golden buy right and it's a great way to enhance the dividend now finally before I, I don't want to get too far on a tangent but look at this if I sell a $65 call I'm still gonna collect that two dollars even if it drops all the way down to 65 now that would be a pretty big drop in the stock but it could drop it could drop ten dollars and I'm still going to make my two and a half percent plus the dividend 
So that that's a great way to protect your account on the downside by selling long term leaps. Now there's going to be some people that have op that no options. They're going to say, "Well, AJ, why don't you just sell calls every month?" Yeah, that that that's a lot of work, but you don't always get a chance. If you sell a front month option and it drops, you may not get any premium in the next option month. It may all get dry up on you, and now you're stuck. So this locks you in for a longer term premium with a dividend attached to it. Okay, I took a long time on that one, but uh, George is asking to buy silver, SLB. Um, just to let you know, uh, my wife and I are have retirement money that's 100 percent her retirement, I should say, 100 percent silver and gold, split evenly. Um, and it's looking a little toppy right now. Here's let me get rid of these lines because these these were actual lines that I was forecasting for silver. Um, and you can see that this this trend line, which is what I was forecasting, is spot on, and it's getting ready to fill this gap up around 2162 and we have higher price on lower volume and we have a doji a sign of indecision and we have a gap below the market so you can see why short term I'm turning bearish on silver but long term I'm very bullish on silver so what I think is if you have it I would take profits in it and wait for the gap to fill and then jump right back in there because I'm expecting a bounce of this roll reversal if you don't have it then wait for it to bounce so what I would say is put a price alert at 1975 and then when you get the price alert watch to see if it starts bouncing off of this line then buy it so that would be your contingent buy order on there all right Sheldon says PEIX Bought, bought at 365. Now these are the cheapest stocks. So you got to watch out because remember, uh, these can move <laughs> uh, as quick or maybe even quicker in percentages. I would sell this baby. Um, he bought it at 365, trading almost ten dollars. And here's why. Well, here's what what I think is going to happen. It's gone vertical, right? This thing has gone up from six to. 670 something to, to nine. it's it's gone up three dollars it's gone up 50 percent since the beginning of February okay so my question to you is <laughs> Sheldon how greedy are you gonna get <laughs> uh, no in all seriousness what I would watch for is the first thing you're gonna see before it starts dropping is gonna see a drop in volume so if tomorrow or the next day you see a red candle that looks lower than this I would at least sell half of them sell half first and then if it keeps going up you still have the other 2500 to profit from does that make sense so sell half on the next red candle and lower volume and then if it completely starts turning lower sell the other half if it goes higher you still have another 2500 to profit from you're in really, really good shape here, so you just have to watch because if I change this to a weekly chart, this is going to look like a much different chart. Ah, it is. Look at that. Let me get rid of these lines and show you the new thing that I see. Ah, good thing you said sell half. Ready? Let me get my, let me get my drawing in here. Can anyone see what I'm about to do? Watch. Can anyone see this right here? See that high right there? Boom. Look at that. It's it's this is a weekly chart now it's creeping up to resistance now look at the weekly volume boom 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 it's falling so uh, that makes me more inclined to say you know let's get out of this take a profit and wait for it to break out before I buy more so hopefully that helps you out you know uh, this is being recorded for our members so uh, I, I encourage everyone to look at this video those of you who are getting it look at the video uh, next month and see how excuse me see how accurate uh, these forecasts are uh, for those of you who are not subscribers uh, that's one of the benefits that we give our, our Oracle subscribers if you're interested in that we have a really good uh, track record uh, just go to the marketguys.com and you can look at the um, the shop page here and you can see where our oracles are this is it right here you know, uh, my partner Bill Shanley is recording this right now, and 
I have to tell you, um, the the percentage of accuracy is the highest in the industry. You're not going to find uh, any people. I've checked. You're not going to find anybody that has a stronger percentage of accuracy. So we price our um, our Oracle subscriptions at $149 a month because we feel that even if you just do one trade out of the month, the profits you'll make from that trade will most likely pay for the subscription. That's why we have people like Paul Farley uh, and others who are on this call that have been long-term subscribers because for them the you know the subscription is paying for itself over and over again. Uh, most of the people on this call are already subscribers, and we offer this as an enhanced service. But the the added value is that we give them the recording uh, because that wouldn't be fair for a non-paying you know a member or just a, a someone that's stopping by for a look. You know, we want to give our, our members more value, so that's why we do that. And uh, as I look at the clock, it's exactly 9 p.m. Eastern Time, and like always, this was one heck of a fast hour because we just breezed right through this. I hope you had a really good time. I always do. And, <clears throat> excuse me, for those who were just being a fly in the wall today, I'm sure you got some you got some trade uh, candidates there for you. You know, some of the things that we look at, um, are uh, trades that you can be doing, and a lot of them are, you know, pretty reasonably priced. So there's something for everyone in these web seminars, and I'm really, really happy that you're able to join us today. So we'll talk to you next time. This was uh, one of our record attendance uh, sessions, so thank you for that, and I'll talk to you next month. Have a good night. Bye bye. <laughs>